Amen. First uh, Peter. First Peter. We'll begin this morning. Getting saved doesn't mean an easy, perfect life. It means a better life. doesn't mean easy and perfect. I haven't heard many testimonies that were just all roses after they got saved. Uh, actually, actually, Jesus Christ warns persecution trials. If you're standing up for Jesus Christ, if you're being a witness, you're going to have to tell people that without Jesus Christ, they're going to go to hell. And so um, if you live this, well, I've said this before, if people choose to live this life without Jesus Christ, well, at the, at the, when they die and leave this earth, well, they're going, to live, they're going to live eternity without Jesus Christ. And that place is called hell. And it's unfortunate. God is not willing any should go there. And neither are we. And so we want to look into the Word of God because we want to be a good testimony. We want to be representatives of Jesus Christ. We don't want to live defeated. We want to live in victorious life. And things are going to go wrong. Things are going to go wrong. If you choose not to witness for Jesus Christ, it's going to go wrong anyway. And if you choose to witness for Jesus Christ, there's no guarantees. <laughs> it's still going to go wrong. But it's better with Him than without Him. And so you have a choice for that. God's not going to force anyone to do that. So 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 19. The Bible says there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, uh, the Bible says, For this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering, and uh, suffering wrongfully. So not only suffering, but the man has to endure grief and suffering, but not only suffering, but suffering wrongfully too. So... You doing good to others and getting treated badly in return. So you, you need to expect that. So suffering wrongfully, verse 20, For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently? So we're not talking here about um, us uh, being treated badly because we deserved it. The, the verse is going to continue. But it's showing that, you know, if I chose to steal something, then... I'm buffeted by going to jail. Uh, I'm getting what I deserve. But God, God is going to tell us what is the glory. What is righteous before God? It's the rest of the verse. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patient, patiently, this is acceptable with God. So the Bible's saying there, if you're just getting buffeted for doing wrong, so I give someone a track, they rip it up in my face, and I punch him in the face. If, if I get buffeted for doing that, there's no glory in that. You know where the glory is and it stands before God? Doing well. So asking that man if he wants me to buy him lunch after he rips the, the, the track in my face, after he curses my Lord and Savior. Yeah? So buffeting for doing well. We're not talking about getting buffeted and, and suffering for for doing something that's wrong anyway. Yeah? So that, that's you're getting what you deserve. We're talking about doing well and suffering for it wrong, wrongfully. You need to expect that as a Christian. You know why I say that? Because unfortunately, too many Christians are thrown in the towel because they, they got the wrong mentality about Christianity. You have already eternal life. So what more do you want? What more do you want after that? It's, it's not promised that you're going to go, you're on your way to heaven and you're going to have everything work out perfectly on the way there. There's, there's nothing in the Bible that says that. It's a bonus if you do, but it's, very, it's not going to happen. I, I haven't seen it happen in my whole uh, 20 years of being saved. So verse 20 again, For what glory is it if ye be buffeted for your faults, ye shall take it patiently. That's, that's not how it works. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Now we're talking. That's acceptable with God. We used to go in and, and preach the gospel to inmates. Most of them knew they got what they deserved. They, they already knew that. Now, if you're in there innocent, really innocent, because some other ones always say that they're innocent and they don't deserve it. But if you're in there and innocent, now, now that's a different story. And so you're going to live your Christian life. And if you're following Jesus Christ in any, any form, in any way, 
You're going to be telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ, telling them that they have guaranteed eternal life, everlasting life, and the return on that is not always going to be good return. So if, don't expect a good investment. Your investment is already paid for. Your inheritance is already paid for when you got saved. And you already have eternal life, and that's, that's guaranteed. But don't, don't expect that you're going to have a, a happy, easy, no troubles life. And like I said, it's not a common sermon that we're going to preach today, but it's reality. It's reality. And we haven't finished the passage yet. Verse 21, For even hereunto were ye called... Hey, you're called to suffer for doing well. So remember that, remember that verse 20 uh, as you read, because all of it comes together uh, like no other book. This King James Bible is written like no other book. This is not, when you read this, you shouldn't be reading this like a novel. You should be reading this as God orchestrating perfectly in order for doing well. Yeah, verse 20, verse 21 you're going, to be, you're going to suffer for doing well and you need to take it patiently and you need to remember that it's acceptable before God. Verse 21, for even hereunto were you called. So you should already know this. Because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow, in his, uh, ye should follow his steps. That's why we keep on repeatedly saying, follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Because when you get saved, you should already know that you're going to be buffeted. You're going to suffer for doing well. And straight away, the Bible doesn't leave you with no help, uh, with no hope. The Bible leaves you with hope. And that's why you need to be saved first. So if you're not saved this morning, please come and see me. If you haven't put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for your soul's salvation, please come see me because none of this, none of this applies if you're not saved because it's all based on the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so you need to have put your faith in that because every example in the Bible is always pointing back to Christ because He's our Lord and Savior. And so it's, it's, a, it's doing that exactly here. 21, for, for even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suff, suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should, ye should follow His steps. So following his steps means that you're going to trust him, come what may. Whatever comes in your life, and most of the time it was because I spent my first 23 years rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, and then when I, when I got saved at 23 years. So most of those consequences are still coming now. Most of those troubles are still coming now. And most of the time troubles are coming because I, I wasn't totally faithful in my 20 years of being saved. But we're going to see this morning, even if you are the Apostle Paul, even if you are, there's still going to trials and troubles. And so our first um, point this morning is look how the Bible points out Jesus Christ. Uh, it gives you you're going to suffer for, well, uh, for doing well uh, when you do well. You will suffer for it. And it points to Jesus Christ because what bad did he do? He is no sin. We're going, to, we're going to see it in a minute. So that's the first thing. And we need to focus in on following his steps. So trust that he knows where he's putting his footprints. Trust that he knows that his steps are in confidence. You can be confident that he's walking the right way. And like I said, you're not going to be, you don't want to come off course as a Christian. You want to be following directly in his footsteps. That's what the Bible says. Follow his steps. Verse 22, who did no sin. You're talking about well doing. You're talking about doing well. He did no sin and he still suffered for us, leaving us an example. Verse 22, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. He not only did no sin, but nothing came out that was wrong out of his mouth. Nothing at all. No deceit, no craftiness, no cunningness. Nothing at all came out of his mouth. That's the example, Christian, that you're following. That's, that's the example you're following. 23, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. He, he didn't get abused and attacked and then went and abused and attacked back. He told Peter to put the sword back in. Where he, he could wipe out, you know, we spoke about this on a Wednesday night. At that point, at his weakest point, he could have wiped out the whole population on this earth right now. When you add up, when he says legions of angels could come at his service. And so he's not going to, he doesn't need to... Um, 
uh, attack back or abuse back. Neither should we. Remember, that's, that's our example. And many people say, well, I'm not Jesus. Yeah, I know. We're, none of us are. We're still in the f- flesh. We're still sinners saved by grace. But he is our example. And you, Christian, you're supposed to be living a Christ-like life. You're not supposed to be living a, a, a life separated from Christ. You're supposed to be living a Christ-like a, for Him to be your Lord. And so, um, uh, verse 23, who, be, who, when He was reviled, reviled not again. When He suffered, He threatened not. So as He was suffering, He didn't come back and threaten uh, with, with words of, of guile or attack or abuse, but committed Himself to Him that judgeth righteously. So that's what Jesus Christ did. He had a commitment to him that judges righteously. That's the Holy Heavenly Father. And so as we walk and follow his footsteps, things happening all around, but we're supposed to be also committed to him. That's why no glory is given to any man. Me, your favorite preacher on YouTube, or any priest or pope or anyone. No one gets the glory but Jesus Christ because I've tried living my own footsteps, didn't work. And I didn't get far before I became nothing. No money, no job, no nothing at all. And so that's where people are heading. And we don't want Christians heading on that path either. We want them staying on the path of the Lord Jesus Christ's footsteps. And so the Bible's clear there, verse 22, did no sin, didn't deserve anything, nothing wrong coming out of his mouth, no deceit. No craftiness. Um, He reviled, but he reviled not again. He suffered. He didn't threaten not in return, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. Verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes we were healed. And so we get the healing when we first got saved. And so I think he's worthy of us following his footsteps because now we n- we no longer alive to sin. We spoke about that last Sunday. As a safe Christian, you're supposed to be dead to sin. And so anything that comes along that the devil wants to use in trials, tribulations or sufferings and wants you to turn from following his footsteps to other things, news, what's going on into the, in the world, and then from there, depression, miserable, uh, have no hope. That's not what God's plan is for you at all. God's plan is for you uh, to keep your mind, keep your eyes on the perfect example that we see here. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's reminding us, see, this is how you do it. This is how you endure grief, suffering, wrong, uh, suffering wrongfully. Verse 19, it's given you the answer. Remember that he he gave, he bore your sins in his own body, not his own. So he's not a sinner. We had one man on the streets yesterday. I think he was Jewish. And he said to me, no, no, Jesus Christ died for his own sins. Ah, but you got it wrong there. Yeah. And so, but he, it was just a hit and run. He just kept running. <laughs> and well, what do you do? You just keep preaching. Yeah. And so uh, he doesn't know. He obviously doesn't know this verse. And he wants to reject Jesus Christ for some other religion, whatever it may be. And so that, that, no other religion is going to guarantee you everlasting life but what the Bible says and what Jesus Christ did for us. And so the Bible's reminding you, you've got better things to worry about than grief and wrongfully so, uh, suffering wrongfully. They're, they're, but for a moment, we're going to see that in a minute if we get there. So reminding you that Jesus Christ and by his stripes you were healed. Uh, verse 25, for you were as sheep going astray, praise God. We were going astray, and that's past tense. But if you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, what are you now? But are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Jesus Christ saves souls. He saves sinners. He reconciles you to a holy God, and he's the only way. No other man, no other person. And the Bible's reminding you of that so that you can endure through your grief and suffering wrongfully. That's what the Bible wants you to do. Many examples of uh, Jesus Christ. Let's look at one. Uh, Matthew chapter 3, just quickly. Matthew chapter 3. Many examples of 
men serving God, giving to God, witnessing for Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ himself, great celebration, great thing that happened. And then almost immediately something bad happening. Let's, re let's read it. And many testimonies that I've heard get saved, few months of a stage of great, great, great fellowship with the Lord. Whatever you want, Lord, I will do. Thank you for saving me. Great appreciation. And then two, three months later, troubles, trials, temptations. And it's, 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 it's a very common testimony. But that doesn't mean you have to do that. If you're still a fairly new Christian or if you've going, been going on strong, you don't have to fall and get back up. You can just stay up with the Lord Jesus Christ and following His footsteps. But you need to have your eyes in the Word of God. We need to be reading the Word of God more than watching TV, news, YouTube, and all of this. So it's the Word of God that stands. Matthew uh, chapter 3. One quick example here of the Lord Jesus Christ. Happy and then straight after. Uh, Matthew chapter 3 verse uh, 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water and lo, the heavens were open unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a, va a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. You can imagine being there. Heavens open, light comes down, voice comes straight out of heaven. And says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. What a great rejoicing time. One verse after that. Chapter 4 verse 1. Then Jesus was led up of the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now is that? Straight away the next chapter, which I don't split chapters up. I believe chapter uh, verse 1. Straight after this blessed time. Now Jesus is led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. How's that? And the Bible's telling you that that was the agenda, but it doesn't mean it succeeded. That was the point. Uh, God wanted to show that God manifest in the flesh has the power to defeat the devil. And so um, verse 2 says, And when he was... When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Jesus Christ in his humanity was hungry. God manifest in the flesh was hungry. That's to show you that he felt every bit of that cross. It wasn't like he wasn't feeling any of it. He, he sweat drops of blood in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane. He can feel all of this. He asked, let this cup pass from me. He got hungry. And he thirsted, God manifest in the flesh. And when the tempter come to him, he said, verse 3, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. What a coincidence. Tempter comes, uh, the devil himself knows that Jesus Christ was fasting 40 days and 40 nights and says, why don't you make some bread and just eat it? What happens to the Christian after he gets saved? He commits, he or her commits, that person commits to God, what happens after that? Devil comes and says, "I think you're making a big deal out of nothing. I think you can put, you can have a bee here and there. I think you can sit back and relax. You don't have to be too much for the Word of God. You don't have to be too much. There's many other Christians. Look, they're not doing that much. You don't have to go all the way. And that's what the Bible hasn't changed. Uh, the, the devil hasn't changed. Sit back, relax, have a smoke, have a drink, enjoy your life." watch a movie, and what happened? I'm not saying that you guys can do whatever you want as Christians. But what we try to do is just because I fell in a ditch, we don't want other people to fall in the same ditch. And so what started then? What started? One cigarette, one, one beer, and then ah, other temptations came along because just the Bible says be sober. I take that, don't even be, don't not be sober, not even for 1%. We've spoken about that before. That means to me, that means be sober 100%. Because when I fell in the ditch, I started to think, oh, I just won. What's wrong with one? And then that one turned to two. And as a saved Christian, 
The same principle that the devil said here. You've committed, but come on, you can't be too much. And as a safe Christian, started to uh, contemplate drinking again. Because two became three, became four. And then started to think, hey, how, how? I used to have a weakness of gambling. And I used to think, oh, why not put 50? Then the, the Lord came down with his rod. And you don't need to learn the hard way, Christian. You, you just need to learn from the Bible. You don't learn from other people's lives and say, well, he got away with it. Maybe I can get away with it. You need to learn from the Bible. The principle of the devil here is to tempt Jesus Christ in the weakness that he had after f fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He went straight to bread. Why didn't he just make bread and eat? Verse 4, but he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hey, how's that for a good teaching? So how about we not have lunch and just have another preaching? No, Jesus Christ is not saying that. He's saying you should be putting the word of God first. That's him too. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So he's saying, he answered, he said, man shall, and he, you know what, you know what he's doing? He's using the word of God to, to battle the devil. He said, it's already written. Yeah, this is not something new. It's already written in Deuteronomy 8.3. And so he's saying, man shall not live by bread alone because the devil's going to come and tempt you with something temporal. He's not going to come and tempt you with eternal. He knows, if you're a saved Christian, he knows you're already saved. His, his aim is just to bring you down. His aim is to stop your mouth from telling others about Jesus. And what's the first thing he's going to do? He's going to tempt you on your weakness. Amen. That's not what we want. He said, Jesus Christ said, and you should say as a Christian, yeah, I don't want my pleasures and desires of my heart. I want what Jesus wants. I want to follow his steps, First Peter. And everything that happens around me, all the temptations that come along. Look, if you've got $10 million in the bank and you get a bill of $1,000, $2,000, no problem. You just pay it. $10,000, no problem. I've got $10 million, I'll just pay it. But if you have $20,000 in the bank and a bill comes at $10,000, now you're shaking. Because that's half of your savings going to be gone. In Jesus Christ, you don't have... A limited amount. You have more than 10 million in the bank. You have eternal life. These temptations and troubles and trials that come your way, just pay them off quickly and get them out, get them out of the life. Just ignore them. You can just ignore them completely. When that man has 20, $10 million in the bank, he can just pay it without getting phased. As a Christian, you shouldn't be phased by any of the suffering, grief, suffering wrongfully. Okay, we understand. It's not fair. But life isn't going to be fair. There's no promise in the Bible that life is going to be fair. You know what's fair? Jesus Christ dying on the cross, being buried three days and rising again. That's, that's what's fair. And he did that for you to guarantee you eternal life. You can't lose that. Amen. I've told Christians that have just gotten saved. You have a choice. You can never, if you, want, if you were truly saved... If you wanted to, you can never come to church again in your life. You, you, know, you know the commitment and faithfulness of God? If you're truly saved, you're still saved. Because church, coming to church doesn't save you and a denomination doesn't save you. You know, what that, you know what that does to the Christian? And you've got to be careful with your wording when you tell them this because you don't want them not coming to church. But you're showing the faithfulness of God that it's not works, it's not what you do. If you're truly saved, you're saved, guaranteed. That's it. But that's supposed to commit you to Him even more. That's supposed to make you walk in His footsteps. God, I appreciate what you've done. How about I do something now? How about I show my appreciation now? The devil's going to come and really press that point where your temptations are. And he knew what he was doing with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he pressed that fasting. He knew he was hungry and he tempted him with making bread and the Lord Jesus Christ, but every word of God. So devil comes and tempts you, you point back to the word of God. No, no, 
I know I'm busy today. I know I've got a million things to do today, and everyone does. Everyone has a million things to do every day. But I'm going to sit down. I'm going to meditate upon the Word of God. And it's a good thing to do that before breakfast. Yeah, yeah. First thing. First thing. We're not saying don't eat. But you're showing the Lord God, you're showing God and you're showing the Lord Jesus Christ that I'm going to sit down, I'm going to read, even if I've got a million things to do. Even if I'm suffering internally and outside, from inside and outside, everyone is, you're not alone. Don't let the, the, the devil um, fool you by saying you're the only one suffering. Everyone is. We just don't, we just don't mope about it. What's, what's, what's a self-pity party going to do? Everyone's suffering. But we keep our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ and, so, and we follow in footsteps. And it's a good thing to take this verse and start to train yourself as a Christian. Seek ye first. Put your eyes, start reading the Word of God. Put Him first every day of your life. You'll see a big change in your life. The complaining will stop. And the focus on your troubles and sorrows and suffering will be off. You, you won't be focused on that anymore. Because like I said, everyone's got that. But it's what you focus on. The world says focus on yourself. We say focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because yourself is going to fail you one day. Jesus Christ will never fail you. Verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written... He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time that thou dash thy foot against the stone. So the devil took him up and he said, why don't you just jump off? Because it's written that, and look, look, the devil knows how to quote scripture here. And he twists it a little bit and he, and he turns the context into, you can jump off Jesus He's going to come and help you and you won't even uh, dash thy foot against a stone. How do we apply that to today? We apply that to today, save Christian. If you're saved, the devil's going to come and say, well, you're saved. You've got guaranteed eternal life. You don't have to go live, live for it. He's, he's going to protect you. He's going to save you anyway. That's what the devil will do. He did the same principle to, to the Lord Jesus Christ. He used scripture to say, you're the son of God. Nothing's going to happen. Jump. Christian, you're saved. What's the difference? Just live your life. You've got heaven any, any, anyway. That's the devil. That's straight out of the devil's mouth. That's straight out of the devil's mentality. What Jesus say, verse 7, Jesus said unto him, it is written again. So he, you better know your Bible. Because that's the only way you're going to com combat the devil. Yeah, he's not just going to go away just because what you think and what you say and your conviction and your opinion. He's, he's going to get, away th get out of there when you start quoting scripture to him. So we all better know our Bibles. Jesus said, it is written again. And he's quoting from the Old Testament. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That's, that's a good one. So Christian, if you're starting to think, yeah, well, I'm saved like I did. Yeah, that's true. I'm saved. I've got eternal life. Why not enjoy my life for a bit? Why not take that plunge and, and start living it up? I've got a good job, good cushy job, good pay. The, the, the pay pays well. No, no, I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ's footsteps. I'm not saying quit your job and follow the Lord. I'm saying do what you need to do, but don't forget to follow the Lord Jesus Christ in his footsteps because if you start believing the devil, look where he's going to end up. He's going to end up somewhere that's not, not good at all. Verse 8, again, the devil. So the devil's failed uh, twice, and now the third time. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. There's the agenda. That's the agenda that, that the devil had from the beginning of the chapter. He wanted Jesus Christ to fall down and worship him. You, Christian, he wants you. Okay, you're saved. But how about you start 
just enjoying some of the things that he has for you in this world. That's not what we want to do. And then what happens then? As the Christian falls more and more into the temptations of this world and the temptations of the devil, starts forgetting about Jesus, starts forgetting about the Lord, I'd put a big question mark on that salvation because you've got the Holy Spirit. That shouldn't be happening. But unfortunately, when a person professes that they're saved and they look like the world exactly, well, who am I to judge them? But it doesn't look like it. As a child of God, you're supposed to have a resemblance. You see my children, they look like me and my wife. Everyone's children, if you look at them, they look like their parents. You're a child of God and you look nothing like Him. I can't see Jesus in you at all. And you're telling me through your mouth that you're saved? Doesn't look like it. And the devil here is saying to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he's going to try and get you to put something else before Jesus Christ. He wants to try and get you to put him, his movies, his worldly music, his, his music about sex, drugs, rock and roll. He wants to try and put movies uh, in front of him where it's teaching you ad- adultery, uh, teaching children. Very subtle, these little cartoons too. You've got to watch out for them. Ch- teaching disobedience to parents, teaching that you've got your own life and you can live your own life when, they, when you as a Christian or when you as a lost person start putting the devil before him. What do you look like? You look like you are falling down and worshipping him. That's not what a Christian should be doing. That's not what a follower of Christ should be doing at all. Then Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Not only worship, not like these churches, let's just join for worship. No, 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 as a Christian, we're supposed to be following. And it says here, and him only shalt thou serve. You're supposed to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, not a servant of the world, the flesh and the devil. So be very careful how you look that people are supposed to see Jesus in you. Verse 11, then the devil leaveth him. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. God manifest in the flesh. King, the Lord Jesus Christ, had angels come and minister to him after the devil tried to tempt him and failed. The Lord's always going to be there, especially when you're following footsteps like this. And if anyone thinks that Jesus Christ didn't go through troubles and didn't feel everything as, as, as 100% man and as 100% God, he felt every one of these. If he went through these things, what do you think you're going to go through? But whose side would you rather be on? Like I said, it's better with him than without him. He- Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. This is a pattern. And it happens to everyone. Please. Please. Don't believe the devil when he says it's only happening to you. If you haven't been through trials and suffering wrongfully and grief, uh, you probably are going to eventually. So you want to be ready for that. And if you have, and if you are, God help us. God guide us through it. We don't want to quit on Jesus. We don't want to quit on God. We don't want to turn our backs on God. And here's a great, this is uh, Hebrews 11. This is a great example. This is called um, the Hall of Fame of the Bible. These, these great men and women here in uh, Hebrews 11, the Lord picks out a few names. And then at the end, he just talks about all of them. These people group perform uh, great works of the faith in the Old Testament in Hebrews 11. And he records them on paper for us to read today. He shows us these great men and women telling us these are the best he had. So uh, if you go through just a chapter, he talks about Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Rahab, Sarah, and all these, if you know your Bible, great, great men and women. And then in verse 30, 32, it says there, and what, shall I, uh, and what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, 
and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David and of uh, Samuel. So this, he's saying here in Hebrews, God's telling us we don't have time to speak of all of them. They were all great men and women. And let's read here in verse 33. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong. That'll happen to you. I've been there. And the Lord, by, his, by God's grace, He made me strong. Very weak in a lot of areas. Wax uh, valiant in fight. So victories all over. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Women receive their dead raised to life again. Keep your finger there. That's group number one. Everything. Very, very good. Very Great victories. Weakness turned to strength. And then the Bible says there in verse 35, midway, and others were tortured. So some victories, some God with them, but God is with them here too. And we know from Paul, Peter, their deaths weren't the greatest. And so here it's telling us of Old Testament people also going through. It says here, group two, this is group two. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. So they were in torture and they refused deliverance from that torture because they wanted to obtain a better resurrection. The everlasting life resurrection, the run that comes with Jesus Christ. Being tortured, they didn't give up. They didn't accept the deliverance from it. Verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, were moreover of, uh, yea, sorry, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. Anyone here gone through that? Torture? Anyone here gone through mocking, scourgings? Uh, been in bonds, been imprisoned for the sake of the gospel? We've got nothing to complain about. Verse 37, they were stoned. Anyone been stoned? They were sawn asunder. You, you think the Bible's just making up stories? This, this happened. This happened for great men and women that stood up for God. And the whole chapter talks about by faith. All this was done by faith. We have seen the cross. We're going to get that, to that in a minute. We, it hasn't finished. These people went through stonings, sawn asunder, verse 37, tempted, slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. So the Bible's telling us, and the Holy Spirit is narrating to us, the world wasn't worthy of all these men and women. They wandered in deserts. How would you like that? That's not a five-star hotel. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. All uh, And all having obtained a good report. Verse 39, the Bible says, every one, of these, every one of these people, men and women, great men and women of God, that by faith trusted God before the cross. It's talking about Old Testament. It says, and these all having obtained a good report through what? Through faith. Through faith. Through faith in the true God of the Bible, through faith in the true God of the Old Testament, they got a good report. And it says they received not the promise. They hadn't seen the Messiah yet. They hadn't seen the Lord Jesus Christ come and, uh, as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us, you got no excuse. God provided a better thing for us. And he's talking about after the cross in Hebrews in the New Testament, that they without uh, without us should not be made perfect, but you are. You are made perfect. Christian, you got, you got, compared to them, you got no excuse. You've got no excuse at all. You've got Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection. You've got the comforter. You've got so many things that we have already preached on. Only when the Bible talks about what God has given you as a Christian, you have access to the Father direct. Direct access to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ. Any issues you have, you go straight to the Father. 
You don't need to pay for a counselor. You don't need to pay a psychologist. You can go straight to the Father. We are reconciled to God. We are adopted into the family of God. We become a child of God. We have an inheritance, joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you remember the last sermon uh, a few weeks ago, we had more to this. We are elected of God in Christ Jesus. We are sanctified through the Lord Jesus Christ. We no longer have to suffer under the rules and the flesh and the, the, the devil and this world. We can be sanctified, separated in Christ Jesus. Our life is in heaven, already got citizens of heaven, already have mansions getting built for us. That's the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are made new creatures. We don't have to fight with the old. We are royal priesthood. We are made servants of God, no longer to be servants of sin. And there's more. We'll preach that in the, in the coming weeks. And so we have all that. All that and more. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Almost there. Second Corinthians chapter 11. Just quickly, Paul also uh, had to go through many things here. Uh, Second Corinthians 11, verse 23. And Paul's saying here, he's telling the church, why are you listening to them that treat you badly? Why are you listening to other people and not listening to me? By inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm writing you this, in, this epistle. And he's saying, you, you're, you're listening to other people. And okay, maybe they have uh, gone through a lot of things, but I treat you well. Why aren't you listening to me? That's what Paul's saying. Listen to me because I did more than they. He's not boasting. He's telling them what he has done for them as a church. And for God, he's proving a point here. And he's saying here in verse 23, Are they ministers uh, ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. So the Apostle Paul uh, had to labor. You're going to have to labor. You're going to have to labor for Jesus Christ. As you have seen, there's not a whole thousands of people rushing to church. There's not a whole thousands of people rushing to get saved. You're going to have to labor for that. You're going to have to see sometimes no numbers at all. Sometimes you're going to see rejections totally. What do we do? Pack up and go home? No. The Lord, uh, the Bible warned us of that. And praise God for my Bible college. They warned us of that too. Don't go out expecting that there's going to be 50, 100 people straight off the bat. You're going to have to labor. So Paul's saying he labored more abundant in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in death, in deaths often. He faced death many times. I don't think any of us have prisons frequently. Verse 24, of the Jews, five stripes received I, 40 stripes saved one. So five times of the Jews. So he's getting beaten. 25, thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned, thrice was uh, I suffered shipwreck, a day and night I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in pearls, that's life-threatening danger, risk and destruction, in pearls of waters, in pearls of robbers, in pearls of mine own countrymen. How's that? His own countrymen. He was in danger, life-threatening from them. In pearls by the heathen, in pearls by the city, in pearls by the wilderness, in pearls in the sea. So he's, he's not having a good time. In pearls among false brethren. Did you see that? So you've got to watch yourself from without the church and within the church. Yeah? False brethren. See, this is why we preach heavily on the church being united one and being in the body. But you can preach all your life. Timothy went through it. Paul went through it. I, I, you know, best preachers in the New Testament. So, of course, we're going to have it. And so we're not going to want pearls from uh, among false brethren, from false brethren. So uh, you're going to have to watch that. Also, 20, uh, 27, in weariness, in painfulness, in watching often, in hunger and thirst, in fasting often, 
in cold and, uh, cold and nakedness. Beside those things that are without, here it is, he's talking about, beside those things that are trying to get into the church, so he's saying, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. So on top of all his suffering and wrongfully suffering and his grief, his care for the churches is the biggest burden. It's the biggest one. And I know that because the care of this church comes upon me every day of the week. And any pastor that cares for the church would have the same thing. But praise God, this is in here. So I can know that the Apostle Paul went through the same thing. I'm not alone. And you're definitely not alone when you're following the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Verse 29, who is weak and I am not weak. He's saying the weak, he was weak with them. Who is offended and I burn not. People getting offended in the church, people that are weak in the church, the pastor and other brethren and elders also share that burden with them. It should be a bother to you when people talk bad about other Christians. And when they're getting offended, it's like I'm getting offended. And I'm going to have to run for that counsel. I'm going to have to run and give them the help that they need. Verse 30, if I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. He had infirmities. He had weaknesses. He had feebleness. He had defects. He had imperfections. He was just a man. I don't agree with people holding up the Apostle Paul. Yes, he was special, but we hold up Jesus Christ and him alone. Paul said he's chief of sinners. So I'm going to follow Jesus Christ's footsteps. And so we're going to follow Jesus Christ. Second uh, Corinthians chapter 12, and we'll, we'll finish. Second Corinthians, same book, chapter 12, next chapter. Verse 7. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the, revel of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the minister of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So we're not preaching hopelessness in trials and tribulations. We're preaching, you know why that's happening? Because notice in that verse, Paul repeats two Two uh, groups of words. What is it? Lest I should be exalted above measure. First part of the verse. The end part of the verse. Lest I should be exalted above measure. We need to train ourselves as Christians so that when trials and tribulations come, you say, thank you, Lord, lest I should be exalted above measure. Because when you're serving Jesus Christ and you start singing and you start witnessing, and you start getting people saved and they start listening to you and you win them to Christ and you start your head starts to get bigger and you start to exalt yourself and this is why the troubles are there this is why Paul had a messenger of Satan to buffet him followed him around and just keep beating him reminding him that lest you should be exalted above measure you know why Look at verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure, th above measure through the abundance of the revelations. So as you grow, you start to see things and you start to learn the word of, the God, word of God. What does that do? It starts getting people coming up to you and saying, praise God, man. That was a great message. And what happens? Oh, that was good. I don't need to study as much next Sunday. I'm good. I know the Bible. <laughs> that's not what the Lord wants. And that's exactly why the troubles go your way. And that's exactly why the Lord, in many ways, shows you that you are not to be exalted above measure. Praise is good. See how it says above measure? You've got to be very, very careful. Everyone has their own level. And so we are not to be exalted above measure. And if it takes being... Uh, uh, in grief, if it takes suffering wrongfully, then let it be. Let it be. You know what that's going to do? It's make you draw nearer to God. It's going to make you draw nearer to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to make me want to follow those footsteps closer because I don't want anything in, in the way between me and my Lord. 
And the Bible continues there and we'll close. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Paul bes besought the Lord thrice. And he asked him and he said that it might depart from me. So be careful what you pray about. Paul asked the Lord that this buffeting from this messenger of Satan might depart from him. And you can, you can ask that. It's not bad to ask the Lord that. You can ask the Lord to get you uh, that no more troubles come your way. Good luck with that. You can ask the Lord for that. That's fine. But what was the answer? So Paul said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Keep praying. You can do more than three times. You can pray. You can keep praying and ask the Lord for it to pass. But what, what the Lord say? You're not always going to get that, that prayer answered because verse 9 says, And he said unto me, that's the Lord, The Lord said unto Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Praise God. Praise God. You know, what the, you, you know what the Lord's answer was for him? My grace is sufficient for thee. You know what the answer is for you? You're saved. You have eternal life. I've showed you the grace of God. I've given you something that you don't deserve. I deserve hell because I was a dirty, rotten sinner. And I deserved it. But Jesus Christ paid for that sin on the cross for me. And the Lord's saying to you, these moments of afflictions, the Bible says that, we, we couldn't get there this morning, but these moments compared to eternal life, one moment, 60 seconds of afflictions are nothing compared to what you have in eternal life. We'll read it in a minute. But the Bible says, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my, my strength, not your strength, God is saying, it's my grace and it's my strength that I want coming through you, Christian. Not your own strength, because that's not going to last. It's not going to get you through the troubles. It's not going to get you through the trials. It's not going to get you through your grief. And it's not going to get you through suffering wrongfully. You need my strength. You need my grace. That's what God said. And this is why you're going to have your eyes in the Bible daily. Because in the flesh, we forget these things. I've, I've read this verse so many times in 20 years and still finding something new in there that will help me. Amen. Praise God for His Word. Verse 9 says, And He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He wants you weak. Every time you try and exalt yourself above measure, He's going to bring you down and bring you weak again so He can show His strength. If the world looks at you and says, well, like Job, they're going to say, well, he's got a perfect life. He's got nothing wrong. Look at him. But if the world sees troubles in your life and you're still following the Lord Jesus Christ and showing his grace and showing perfect strength, that's Jesus Christ's strength and showing him uh, perfect in weakness. Look what Paul said most gladly now. Now, Paul is going to gladly rather... Uh, uh, he's going to gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Not your own power, Christ's power. Let's close in a word of prayer.